morning, everybody. Glad to visit with you today and uh, continue to have conversations with friends of ours at Vanderblumen. Uh, in this case, a partner of ours, Jenny uh, Catron. Did I say it right? You did. You got it right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's taken me forever. And I did have to say to Max when we first started working together, okay, is it Lucado or Lucado? You know, Lucado, <laughs> Potato. Uh, so. uh, it, my last name is one of those. So I just kind of roll with it, however it gets pronounced. But you've got it right. Well, I'm it's a Catherine. little sensitive to people that have names that are hard to pronounce. Just yeah, yeah. be my issue. Who knows? But uh, that's great. Uh, Glad to have you here, Jenny. Uh, Jenny's been working with us for a long time. Uh, we actually met you, Jenny, when you were at a church that we got to help do a search for. So Yeah, for uh, sure. And that's that's been a while. So we, yeah, we... And we now know. you attend a church where I think we put your pastor there. He's been there a while now, right? He's been uh, there, I think, six or seven years now. So yeah. yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Can't get away from you guys, you know, so it's good. <laughs> uh, it's fun. So, um... From our house, literally my house, and the what looks like studio, but it's actually my kid's bunk room with a cover oh, over it. Uh, love it. To, in Houston to Appleton, Wisconsin. Hello to everybody. We uh, Jenny has built a, a really great business around helping workplace culture, yeah. which, as you know, is a passion of mine. I wrote a book on it, and then we don't really do that, but people ask us, could you do culture consulting? And we're like we can, we built a free thing called the culture tool.com. You can go there and take it. But uh, if it gets past just triage, we send things over to Jenny and uh, Jenny, what are you, what are you seeing? I mean, we're, yeah. we're recording this the day after Easter uh -huh. and uh, is, we've been, I guess, officially a month since uh, we were told things were closing up here in Houston. What, what are you seeing about workplace culture now that we're all kind of adjusting to this new, and I'm going to be the optimist to say temporary, normal. <laughs> right. Yeah. What are you seeing? Yeah. Well, and William, thanks for, thanks for having this conversation. And we're always grateful to be in partnership with you guys through the years. So uh, I'm, I, I always love organizations and teams that value culture the way that I do. That's just something funny enough, something I kind of stumbled upon in my work. It was the significance of team culture and just how much it mattered. And uh, it's been really fascinating for me to watch these last few weeks because, you know, immediately, especially the churches that you and I both serve, you know, they're triaging the, our whole world got upended and we have to figure out how to do church online. And so there was just a lot of like reacting to those very practical realities of the way we do ministry has been completely changed. And that was true also for businesses and nonprofits. Everybody's had to rethink, how do we do what we do because it's been so upended over the last month. But um, what I have noticed is that the organizations that are also paying attention to, okay, what does this mean for my team? And yes, everybody's had to figure out, okay, how do we do virtual meetings and Zoom meetings or, you know, whatever, whatever tool or resource you use. Uh, and it's caused us to ask some of those questions, but the teams that have really leaned into it and said, hey, we're not going to just use those things as we have to, but we're going to start really engaging uh, and not doing only the things we need to, to stay in communication with one another, but we're going to really intentionally use uh, our digital tools to really work effectively together. I'm seeing a distinction, I guess is what I'm saying, is there are teams that are, are um, kind of just engaging as, ne as needed and hoping to just weather this, you know, this craziness. And then there are teams that are saying, okay, wait, we're going to just intentionally use these digital mediums to stay in touch, to stay virtually face-to-face -face as much as possible. And I think the teams doing the latter are going to be a lot stronger for it. Our, our pastor at our, we go to a rather traditional Methodist church, which is kind of ironic given that we work love with it. amazingly modern churches. Uh, but uh, he says, uh, you know, a good pastor never wastes a good crisis. So true. It's so true. You know, I mean, one of the things I've been reflecting on is, and you know this, but when I was at uh, Cross Point in Nashville way back, that's when you and I first connected. But in 2010, we went through the flood, the, the 2010 flood of Nashville, which was a, I mean, it was the, a thousand year flood. It, there was significant damage to thousands of homes. Three of our staff members lost their homes. I mean, it was, it was really, it was a, it was a crisis for our community. And, uh, and so I've been reflecting on that season a lot, because that was one of the first like really major crises that I had led through. Uh, mm. And what I, and as I've been talking to the, the churches and the leaders that we serve here at Foresight, 
I have been reminiscing some of those moments of how I led during that season, during the flood. And, uh, and, you know, and you just, you, and leaning into the power of team, leaning into, um, you know, some of the values that have been a part of your culture, whether stated or otherwise, but the stronger your values and the stronger your team dynamics were going into the crisis, the, the better you're able to uh, navigate through the crisis. And um, so I've been finding myself kind of going back to those moments and reminiscing, what did it take from me as a leader in that moment to unify our team, to get our team connected? Um, and, and really what that required was a lot of energy and leadership from my part. I think one of the things I've noticed both in myself and with the leaders that we work with is that we have a tendency to focus on kind of the task at hand. Like we get, in, we get into, and again, triage mode. We've been just trying to figure out what in the world is going on and I have a tendency to be kind of task focused by nature anyway. And so I can start to uh, neglect my team instead of like be more present and more engaged. And that's one of the things I've been telling leaders through this is like your team actually needs more of you. They need to see you more. They need to hear from you more. And granted, that's, that's a huge tension for you as a leader because you've got a lot of de decisions to make. You're looking at financials. You're looking at some other pieces of just you know, whatever your world is, whatever it looks like, you've got a lot of things on your plate that you're having to navigate, but your team needs you more than ever because their whole world has been upended. And uh, so that's one of the things I, I went back to what I remember from the 2010 flood and how instinctively, and we actually had another pastor leader tell myself and um, our lead pastor at the time said, you guys need to be out front and you, they need, your team needs to see you, the community needs to see you was some of the best advice we ever got. And yeah. um, prioritizing that of like going, my team needs me and then I can lead through and work through them um, has been something I've been trying to keep in mind in this season as well. Well, there's nothing to do, you know? So, <laughs> so you have uh, uh, the thousand year flood. I think in the last 10 years in Houston, we've had 3,000 year floods. And yes, <laughs> you, yes. You, you watch the stupid radar track a hurricane and it goes, ch -ch 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 -ch. and you just keep waiting for something to happen. And this is even slower than that, like, right. it's like watching yes. paint dry. And one thing I've uh, discovered that, that I think uh, speaks into the same dynamic you're mentioning is how much people want to talk on the phone. Right. Or, yes. Observe, like yeah. people that I can't get 10 minutes from during the normal world right. are now like, yeah, let's sit and talk for an hour. You know, I could rattle off the names of some super task oriented people that are all of a yes. sudden, you know, so I, I think there's a, a you know, C.S. Lewis had a, I, th I think he quotes his mentor, George MacDonald, but wherever the quote came from, it is, uh, you know, hell is God's granting of our final wish to be left alone. Oh, wow. And, I, you know, as much as introverts love their alone time, I think everybody's had enough of it. And yeah. uh, the, the, the ability to just care. Right? We had our lead team meeting last Friday, Thursday afternoon. We took Good Friday off. Yeah. And uh, on Thursday afternoon, I said, so guys, I don't have much of an agenda. What can I do to help each of you? Mm -hmm. And all of them, the name said, if you could just make time to call everyone on my team this next week. Right. Yes. I'm yeah. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, simple. Right. But just people want to be like seen and acknowledged. And again, like you said, we're, we're not only are we facing a crisis, we're facing this dynamic of we're separated from one another. And yeah. I know you guys at Vanderbloom, and this is a big value of yours in that, you know, I mean, team culture is so critical and core to who you all are anyway, but that working together dynamic, even though you have consultants who have to fly here, there, and everywhere to serve the organizations you work with, you guys still pull everybody back and have this, you know, strong team dynamic office culture that is just really inspiring and people love being a part of. And all of a sudden that's been stripped away. So, okay. you know. Yeah. Jenny's being nice, by the way. I'll get really transparent here. What you're not knowing is I've tried to hire her more times than I can remember. And the whole moving to Houston thing has been sort of the trip up. So I was going to say that was a no, non-starter. I was like, I'm not moving to Houston. Uh, but we find other ways to partner. So we may, we, we make it work. We, it's the, you're right, though. It's whether you're doing it uh, a long distance or not. I mean, 
I, we were talking before because we've enjoyed talking uh, before we started recording. Right, yeah. That, uh, one of our mutual friends, Eric Geiger, who's the pastor out at Mariners, we had the uh, honor of helping Mariners figure out that he was the guy God was calling. Yeah. And uh, so we've stayed in touch more than before that. And uh, he said, you know, we, we love our large gatherings of worship because mm-hmm. they are an echo of what we're promised to have in heaven, where countless multitudes will be together, yeah. every tribe, every tongue. He said, and you know, we're a little bit diverse at Mariners, but not like heaven. We're just right. an echo. And, and we sing okay, but not like heaven. And he says, it's that echo. And he said, you know, this, this virtual stuff has been great. It's great that we can be online, but right. now we're having to live with an echo of the echo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And it's yes. just not the same. I, I, yep. I might just be a curmudgeon. I'm such a curmudgeon, Jenny, that our family got dressed up for Easter service yesterday. I mean, <laughs> I love poor, it. Poor teenage boy was like, what? For real? Yeah, yeah. you're going to make so, me do this? Yeah. But he's good. He put on a blazer and we all sat outside and um, uh, watched worship in our little outdoor area. But That's so um, good. I, yeah. I do think I am a curmudgeon or right in the saying um, uh, th- there is a togetherness yes. that is missing now and yep. leaders who can find a way to create it will help their culture. I mean, you, yeah. you, you had a little guide. Was it seven keys yeah. to your workplace culture in a crisis or something? Yeah. Like that? Seven ways to nurture your culture in crisis. Um, or, a couple of those run us through one or two of them. Yeah. You know, and one of the things that um, I was even thinking, as you were saying that I'll give a couple of these ways here in a minute, but the, um, that dynamic of uh no, recognizing that people want to be connected. And I think what the tendency is, and this is actually um, part of one of the, one of those is be visible, which I said a few minutes ago, one of those seven things is be visible and that we as leaders need to be present. But even in that is not just present to say, okay, here's what we need to do. And here's our plan and here's our strategy. And like, you know, uh, creating those moments of connection. And so, and this takes work. So this is one of the things that I'm seeing, again, I'm seeing teams that are figuring this out well, are seeing the benefits of it, but recognizing that that we don't just need to call or Zoom or um, Slack message one another when we have something we need our teams to do. We need to create those moments of just human connection. So I'm seeing some staff teams do like a, a virtual staff lunch, like once a week, where there's no agenda. It's not, it's not the weekly staff meeting agenda. It's just, hey, everybody hop on the Zoom call for an hour, bring your lunch, and we're just chit-chatting. We're just catching up on life because those moments that we used to chit-chat at the coffee maker when we came in in the morning, like just even thinking through what are those little like just human moments that happen when we're officing together and um, how do we recreate those virtually? And it, that's not easy. And it's often a little awkward. <laughs> so... Yeah. We have as a leader have to figure out how do I create just those little touch points, you know, on our, with my team on our Slack um, uh, channel, we have a, or Slack thing, we have a channel that's just like family stuff, right? Like we're just like set, share pictures of your kids or tell us something that happened in your family this week. The stuff that we usually would just chit chat with in the hallway or at the beginning of a meeting before we, everybody got there and we started the conversation. Yep. Figure out how do I create those moments of human connection in, in this virtual dynamic? And it feels a little funky, but that's going to be, that's going to be critical to keeping that sense of community with your team. And I would say, uh, by the way, Jenny threw a word out that we both use Slack and you're like, who's Slack? Oh yeah. Sorry. (laughs) Oh, what's a Slack? And I don't even know that. Is that some new TikTok? Uh, No, it's not. Uh, It's actually used. I think 95 of the fortune 100 companies uses an app that it it, it replaces group texting. And it was a really hard pivot for us because we were used to just having a group chat with our consultants, a group. And, and the, uh, my wife gets credit for getting us to switch to it because you can archive it. Yeah. So this is over 10 years from now. You're not going to be able to dig up your group texts from your team, right. but you can archive it and search it. You can even tie it to your CRM at a church. Yeah. Like uh, I think CCB speaks to Slack. Oh, so, nice. And, yeah. Which is also, as a guy who oversees searches for staff people, super duper helpful 
when an employee leaves and they take their mobile phone with them with all right. of their chat chat if you've got slack it's there and it, and yeah. it can be uh, I, I think one of the things that i've been slacking on that i shouldn't be is keeping a daily diary because you yeah, yeah. kids and grandkids are going to want to read about this so there's uh, Slack, little infomercial. We're not getting paid for this. <laughs> no, no. Referral code, but uh, I think you can download it. I don't even know what what we pay for it, but it, it can't be a, whole, a big expense. Uh, no, it's not. Yeah, I, can, I don't even remember either. But I'm a I'm a much smaller organization. I'd have my I'd have my eyeballs on that if it were significant. So, um, so yeah, and it's just it. And part of what I would say in that too, one of the other things I talk about um, in that this tool that you guys can all download is. Um, reestablishing your structure and your rhythms, like whatever you did in, per because here's the thing, you know, we, I think when this first started, we all thought, oh, a couple weeks of interruption. Well, we're all realizing this is a little longer than we thought. And it's still at the, the time we're recording this, we're not really sure how much longer most of us are going to be shelter in place. And there are no new episodes of Tiger King. So <laughs> I mean, it's like, you're not going to, what are you going to do? You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. This is, this is, this is our world for now. And so as a leader, you've got to figure out, hey, we're just not trying to limp through a couple weeks of this. This is at least our, our temp, like you said, temporary new normal. You know, this is for, for, for a short time, this is our new normal. So what are those rhythms of meeting schedules and what tools do you use and for what purpose? And coming back and clarifying that stuff is super important, right? To tell your team, hey, we, this is what we do in this meeting, in this meeting, this is the, you know, is this strategic or is this tactical? Um, here's how we use Slack. Here's how we use email. Here's when we phone. Here's when we, here's when we text. And be also because we have to also take into account, and this speaks to um, one of the number seven on the list is attending to social and emotional needs of your team. Because mm -hmm. all of a sudden you've got people at home who are having to also homeschool their kids and their spouse is also home. I mean, you're in the bunk room with a Vanderblumen thing behind you, you know, I'm sure your whole family's had to readjust so that you and your wife can both work from home. The kids can do school from home. Like there's a lot that we're all having to adjust to. So there's one company that I was talking to, they actually adjusted their office hours and uh, most of their staff are, you know, they're all working from home, but they're saying office hours are nine to three. And, um, you know, and, and then they have within those when like meeting hours are. Yes. So there's some level of, hey, make some adjustments, but find a rhythm and a structure that you can communicate to their staff because we all need, I mean, our ability, you talked about this before we started recording too, the, the importance of disciplines and the importance of routine. And to some degree, the more, the more routine we have, the more, um, there's, there's a little settledness to that. There's, it's kind of calming to know we have a routine and everybody's routine has been disrupted. So for us as leaders, if we can figure out what's that, what's the routine right now in this climate and how can we set those expectations for our team, um, you're actually bringing them a little bit of peace to the rest of the craziness that they're trying to navigate. It's, it's the very first thing God did. Yeah. He, you know, he, he created patterns. He brought order out of chaos. He started light. He set, you know, uh, I love our clients that are in the charismatic world and that can flow and move and shift. And that's all cool. But like sure. the Holy Spirit and my home Presbyterian church growing up, the Holy Spirit moved for 59 minutes every Sunday. And that was it. And I used to be like <laughs> right? embarrassed about it. But, but the reality is God's first act was to create patterns and rhythms yeah. and yes. order. And, yep. and you, if, if you uh, who are watching, if you have children, if you remember when they were little, the best oh, thing you can sure. do is put them on patterns and put them in rhythms. And our house, you know, uh, it, it, some of our kids probably think they're living in a work camp, but uh, it, it, there is a schedule and it's posted and, the, and it creates sanity. I, I, was reading, I was reading several uh, case studies on how people who survived solitary confinement did it. And over and over and over, it was, I had to create a schedule. I'd yeah. walk 47 laps around the cell or I'd, yeah. you know, mark the days or whatever it is, but there had to be yep. a pattern. And, and I think that will help uh, company culture. If I'm, if I'm, I mean, maybe I'm just a run in a work camp, but. Well, I, I, I'm the same. And there's a ton of research around this too. I just finished reading. Um, there's a book called eat, sleep, work, repeat. And it speaks to a lot of like the importance of our patterns and our rhythms and disciplines as individuals and then for teams and how much 
uh, some of those things can really contribute to healthy dynamics in a team culture and, and really ultimately the, the productivity and the output of a team. Because this, this book is not a, a faith-based book. It's just a, a book steeped in a lot of research that helps make a case for why things like that actually are quite important. And that's one of the things I think we as leaders just need to acknowledge. And, and this is why I think it bears some of the attention you and I are just giving to it is that as leaders, that comes a bit more naturally to us because we're, we're leaders, because we're wired to kind of see a little bit out ahead. We're, yes. we're, we're uh, wired to anticipate. And so we're like, oh yeah, yep, I've got to get my routine. I got to get, you know, things. And so we assume that our teams will do that as well. But I'm, my encouragement to you is, is help set that pace and help reset those expectations in this season. And, and again, I'm guessing for a lot of our church leaders that are watching, um, these weeks running up to Easter have just been triage, like just figure yeah. it out. Everything's on fire. Everything's just figure out how do we do this? How do we do Easter for the first time, not in person? Now you need to settle in and go, okay, what do we need to do from a rhythms and structure standpoint mm -hmm. that help us reconnect as a team? Because you've probably been connecting just in the urgency of of the last few weeks. Now you need to figure out what do we need to do to keep healthy rhythms as a team. And then one of the other things I would say um, that's key to this, it's earlier in the list of the seven, is that you've got to lead yourself well. Um, you guys hear me say all the time, lead yourself well to lead others better. And so that reminder that for all of us, this is, this is no longer just a sprint of a couple of weeks. This is more of a marathon kind that's of right. thing that we're leading through. And so we've got to find a sustainable pace. And so on the other side of Easter, now that we're settling into, there's probably at least a few more weeks, possibly months of this. How do we find a rhythm, especially in leading our teams, that helps us all come out stronger on the other side of that? And that's really my hope for teams. So I think we can be stronger on the other side of this. How you nurture your culture and how you attend to your team. And really, William, we need our teams on the other side of this. Even if we have to make some hard decisions of some downsizing, which is a real reality for a lot of organizations, right? Even with that, the team that we come through this together, we have the potential to be positioned for even greater impact on the other side of this. Yes. If we're intentional to steward these moments with our team, we can build okay. such key moments of connectivity. We can uh, solidify those values because we're, uh, I think Lencioni talks about this a lot, that you either become more unified or more divided in crisis that for your yeah. team. And so I want, I want us more unified. I want us stronger so we can come through this and be able to do the ministry or the work that we're called to with either even greater effectiveness on the other side of it. Well, it's so good. And, and from a, uh, this is where our work meshes together. You talk about the culture. We talk about hiring, firing. There are going to be downsizings that yeah. happen in churches, even with the great care act that Congress put through, there's going to be. Yeah. There's still some. And layoffs. And what we're telling clients is, once that happens and you're down to your reduced workforce, um, the people who are with you through this will be with you forever. Yes. Like you're not going to turn around and fire somebody who walks through this gauntlet with you. Right. So better to work on culture now. Yes. So that since you're, you're kind of stuck with each other now, <laughs> like it, right? it would be a great time to, to solidify those values. I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I talk to some people who are like, I'm binging on Netflix and I'm eating too much and I like riding around in the car. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm working harder than I've ever worked. And Say, I, I want to know who those folks are because I'm well, like, I don't, I don't want my <laughs> team because, because it's, you know, the, no, so the, right. the natural set point is for us to lay in bed and do nothing. I mean, that's yes. what, yeah. but, but those who are taking those extra steps now, I think are going to see enormous dividends on the other side. So. I agree. Well, and kind of to your point there, uh, and this is actually the first one of the seven that I list is that we got to call people to purpose, right? Like we all need a sense of purpose. So if we're, if, cause we all are tempted to just, I want to, I want to go crawl. I don't want to crawl out of bed. I want to just kind of, you know, pull the covers over until this thing is over. And that's not realistic and it's not healthy for us. And so we do need, one of the things I think we can do as leaders is help connect people back to a purpose that's bigger than themselves and help them align with something of significance. And all everybody who's watching this is doing meaningful, significant work. Uh, you wouldn't be giving your life to it if it wasn't. 
And so helping connect our teams back to that to say, hey guys, I know we can't do ministry the way we did it. In my case, my team can't go serve and be on site with, with teams the way we would have historically. So now we're asking the question, well, how can we, right? How can we serve leaders in this season in ways that maybe we didn't before? And, you know, we, uh, we doing things like extra coaching calls and uh, creating more free resources and creating workshops via Zoom to help teams with culture instead of having to be on site. And so it, it, it's challenged us, and I, as I know it has most of the people watching, to say we can't do things the way we used to do them, but we can still serve the essence of our mission. That's and right. so if we can get back to that to say, hey, what, why are we here? What is the mission of this organization, this church, this ministry? And how can we still live out this mission and call people back to that? I think um, maybe then our, our Netflix binging will go down a little bit and we'll see some purpose even in this crisis. Well, and, and I think the, uh, I think through, so I think smart leaders are doing this. I'm not a super smart leader, but I try and get around them so I can learn from them. And the really smart people that I'm talking to now are, yes, they're dealing with now, but the leaders are always looking a little farther ahead, as you mentioned earlier. For sure. And they're thinking, so what? does this look like once we're on the other side? And, yeah. you know, there are all these great conversations about what's going to stick around and what's not, you know, yep. small groups over Zoom seems to be a thing. But, yep. I, you know, one of the things that no matter what happens with large gatherings or, or Zoom is relational skills yes. and fitting in relationally with others is going to be the new gold standard. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's always been, I mean, like Jay yeah. Mitchell, who has done more searches for us than anybody on our team, uh, said to me some time back, he's like, wait, I'm, I'm always amazed at the end of a search, when we get down to the last few candidates, how frequently it comes down to, well, who gets along well with others? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. but, yes. but now that you can, everyone in, in America, and I guess the world has figured out well, if I can't go to church, I can just stream my church. Oh, wait. Or I could stream Stephen Furtick, who's a really good preacher, or Louis Giglio. Right. Or, so the, the idea that you're going to come to church for tasks and content, like that's over. Right, right. You know? yep. And, yep. and the new team culture that, that will be defined is where can you find people who really are relational yes. uh, in a way that is more than normal? Well, you and I were talking about this before we started recording as well, but the churches that are getting on the phone and calling through their congregation, calling through their attendee list to just say hello and check in on them are some of the churches that I'm seeing. And again, that's calling people back to purpose, right? Because it's like, oh, we used to just, you know, preach to the crowd and everybody would gather on Sundays and we would, we, you know, had this feeling that we were, and we were in many ways, like pouring into and investing into these folks. Well, now we've got to go back to like some of the basics of, Hey, I'm yep. picking up the phone and I'm shocked by the number of church leaders that I'm speaking to who are saying, and people actually want to talk. We're not just getting voicemails. We're getting people telling us their story and telling us how they're doing and thanking us so much for checking on them because people want to be seen, right? They yep. want to be seen. They want to know they belong. And I think you're exactly right that that emotional intelligence quotient, it has been a different, it's becoming a greater differentiator anyway in workplace culture, but it, I think it is going to significantly set us apart in this next season as we recover from this, that but, those who have those skills are, are going to stand out. And, and, and those who fit in their particular place, like yes. culturally, yes. Like I, I foresee we're going to have to find a new kind of pastor for, for churches. Yeah. Uh, it, it, one of the things Crosspoint did in that flood was yeah. it became, ironically, a church for the city. Now there's yeah. church of the city in Nashville. But, in Nashville, uh, yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, I remember thinking when I watched you guys go through that, I don't know a really great pastor who doesn't have a great heart for their particular city. And I think right. you're going to see highly contextualized preaching now. I, yeah, because the the great messages that are going to happen, you can go watch online anywhere. But the, you know, this week in the little town of West University Place, where I live in South uh -huh. Houston, this uh -huh. happened, and, and it reminds me of uh, growing up. We had 
a couple of preachers and one came through that was he was just awful in the pulpit he was terrible which was not normal for us and i remember talking to somebody saying why do you keep going to church when the preacher can't preach and the person looked at me and said he can't preach himself out of a wet paper bag but he was there for me when mom died he was yeah. there for me when my kid was born he was there for me yeah. and and like yeah. i think there was that was normal yeah. and and then with the fantastic church growth movement that happened in the 90s and 2000s it was yep. get the best communicator you can and i think we're going to we're going to find a new center and a new so. type of skill set will become uh more valued so i agree i agree yeah that's good good well, to dream about the future a little bit with you jenny but but likewise. wow super helpful advice for teams that are going through a uh, culture crisis right now and and the leaders that run toward that are gonna i really i really do believe that i really do be, believe that and as we as leaders just pay attention to how do i nurture my team how do i help us grow stronger through this and and know that that's possible i think that's part that's the first like paradigm shift we have to make is that we don't have to just survive this. Like we can really come out of this stronger as a team. And yes, it will be hard, but some of those moments that are the most challenging are some of the mo moments that are the most refining for us as a team. And, you know, I was talking to a leader yes, that last week that they said, oh, it's becoming clear on our team in this moment who really, who really is fitting and thriving with us and who is not. And yeah. so they were actually, you know, having to make some hard decisions about, some potential cuts within their team, but it was, the, it was becoming very clear who was really aligning well with their values. And, you know, and I say values multiplied by our behavior equals culture. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. kind of a short like way to test for culture is, Hey, what do we, what do we value? What's important to us as a team? And then how do we behave congruent with those values? And then that really shapes culture. And, um, it, it, they're, they're noticing. And I think a lot of us will notice this too, that it will become clear who's really with us and in this and really has a sense of call to our particular team and our particular culture. And um, my hope is that that enables you as leaders to be stronger and to build greater teams through it. Totally agree. One of the things I foresee in hiring, so there'll be layoffs, right? And then we'll get through this. Yep. And there will be a storm surge of church attendance. And yes. you might say, well, people are going to be afraid to get around one another. I'm not buying it. People have yeah. very short memory and uh, it's just, I'm not buying it. And when that storm surge happens, one of my fears that I don't think it'll happen, but, but it's a concern is, okay, so we got all these unemployed people. I can hire anybody I need. Well, actually, it's going to be harder to tell who needs a job and yes. who's actually a fit for the culture. And the smart leaders are going to figure out how to solve that equation. Well, and here's one really practical thing to do in that is if, I mean, I'm a big fan of, I think every team should have stated cultures and that's different than your church or stated values. And that's different than your um, church values. You the know, we have church values. congregational values, right? You have values that are like core to who we are as a body of believers, but then you should have a set of values that are, Hey, this is how we work as a team. This that's is what, this is what's really important for us to, to, these are those guiding principles that kind of shape how we work together. And um, if you've never really uh, put those to paper, and, and by the way, they exist, whether you've acknowledged them or not, they just not might be what you wanted them to be. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> but this is a really key time because the ones that are really key will surface for you right now. Yes. And you'll notice, like even if you kind of inventory your team, oh, this person over here who's, who's just knocking it out of the park, Here's what I'm seeing in them. I'm seeing resilience. I'm seeing flexibility. I'm seeing a uh, whatever it takes kind of attitude. I'm seeing really good communication from them. You know, so so look for what are those things that have stood out to you that have said this is what has made our team great in this moment. And if you can get those clarified right now, and then be begin to put more language around them, and we have other resources on our website that you can check out for more more tools for that. But like put more language around those things so that it's the, it becomes, it, you, you've, you've started to build that, that a framework for your culture that'll enable you and equip you for that hiring piece. So then when you call William and his team, you can say, hey, here's, here's, here's what's important to our culture. And that'll even equip you guys even better to be able to help them find a great fit. 
That's so good. It's all about. And I didn't, he didn't even plan that, but that's the truth no, of it. <laughs> it it's, uh, it's, it's, it, you know, hiring is like uh, organ transplants and yes, donor list is one thing, but the real money is in the tissue match. Uh, yes. So yeah. Well, so Jenny, um, it's getforesight.com, F-O-R-E, right? Uh, actually the number four. It's get oh, the, the number, the number okay. four and S-I-G-H-T dot com. Yeah. Actually, I think either way works, but we, yeah. the number four. Uh, and if you can't find that, you can find her on our page and we'll send out uh, links to everything. And Jenny's not, she's wise. So she's not selling anything to you right now, but I happen to know that if you want to work on your cultural values right now, this is the time to do it. So you can know your DNA so well that the next hire will be a total yeah. tissue match. You can call her. You, she does consulting virtually. It doesn't have to be uh, wait till this is all over sort of thing. Sure. So, yeah. Thanks, William. Sure. Jenny, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate you making time and really appreciate the partnership. Likewise. Thanks so much. And we're cheering all of you on as you're leading well through this season.